going to have Aiden Bassett come up and lead us in a song before we have any um, get started this morning. Aiden is a junior in the business program and more importantly, an excellent singer, a budding hymn writer, and one of my good students. So Aiden, we're going to turn it over to you. Good morning. Let's sing As the Deer together. Help us to not see knowledge of these words as an end in themselves, but to truly see your goodness, the gospel of the Exodus, to know what kind of God you are, and to be changed into a people in your image. We thank you so much for the work people have done to prepare us, and we pray that you would bless these efforts and that would be true fruit in our lives and in this world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, for those of you who are here this morning at the 8 o'clock hour, it will be your um, very great pleasure to hear Mark Russell. If you know Mark Russell and have talked to him for about two seconds, you know that he is from Kentucky. And although he is from Kentucky, and you can hear him talk about basketball, more importantly, he married his wife, an um, alum from 84. He moved very quickly to Valparaiso, Indiana, and he has been there ever since. In an age where we often, especially those of us who preach, move around so often, having been there for so long, lends Mark, I think, a wisdom and an experience that few others share. I know Mark not only to be a good student of the Word, but a caring, kind, and dedicated servant of Christ. And to him, I hope you'll give your attention as we hear him speak this morning. Good morning, everyone. Take your Bibles out and open to Exodus chapter 1, please. Exodus chapter 1. 
it's an honor to be here this morning. I have so many friends and family who have expressed so much encouragement to me. It kind of makes me a little nervous considering how much uh, encouragement I've been given. But I am truly honored to be here, especially since I've been joking all week that I'm a Gentile allowing, being allowed into the temple since I was not a student here. But I appreciate all of you being here at this early hour. And those of you who are streaming in the central time, bless your heart. <laughs> this morning in the time allowed, we are going to consider the thought of the conquest in the kingdom, the conquest of God over the kingdom of the world. Now, it doesn't take a lot of Bible study to know that the Exodus is a conflict between God's people and Egypt. The conflict in Exodus is an important study because what we are going to begin to see in this conflict is not only the origins and the history of God's people moving forward from Genesis into Exodus, but it fills and expands the development of this conflict. And what I am hoping to see, and what I'm hoping to help all of us see, and what I have seen in preparation for this study, is how this is an overarching narrative in all of the Bible. The conflict is easily seen in chapter 1 and verse 8 with this ominous, ominous phrase. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. How were you in Egypt and not know Joseph? Now, if you were to talk to Jared about Joseph, you may not want to know as much about Joseph as you, as you want, but how, Joseph saved Egypt. How do you not know Joseph? But going forward, what we see now is those who were on the side of God's people allowed them to be shepherds, allowed them to thrive and become a great number as God had promised. Now the battle lines are drawn and they become the enemy. They become the enemy of God's people. They are the bad guys. But as noted, hopefully we can see the larger context here. Just as this lectureship is a small piece of an overall plan that the Bible department put together, Exodus is a story within this overarching narrative of spiritual conflict. And central to the narrative of the Bible is the conflict, not only as it happens on the earth, but as it happens in a larger scale between God and our adversary. And what begins in the garden, Philip Martin is here this morning, what begins in the garden with the initial conflict and the original failure of mankind we see almost on the very first page of the Hebrew Bible, God's intended victory in the first Messianic prophecy in Genesis 3.15. And the end is told when the adversary is rendered powerless in the apocalypse of John. And between Genesis and the apocalypse, we see this conflict playing out. And while our focus is at Exodus today, good Bible students should at least endeavor to see this and how this smaller story in Exodus fits into this narrative. Now, I know in the 21st century, narrative is an overused term, but I'm going to use it today because it's appropriate, <laughs> because there is a narrative of conflict in Scripture. Our adversary's skill at tempting people in Genesis it takes a step up in the book of Exodus. It tells the story, Exodus tells the story of the conflict between Egypt and Israel. And that might be fine, and it is part of the story. But our adversary begins on a national level, beguiling people to act in ways that God never intended men to act. He beguiles them, and deceives them into behaving like God would not want men to act. Brothers and sisters, one of the things, if you take away anything this morning out of this lesson, is that we do not need to act or root for the kingdoms of men when it acts like the kingdoms of men. We need to be rooting for and praying for and working toward being more like the people of God. And we're going, we see this divergence, especially in Exodus. 
Now, while most likely in Exodus, we have this first occurrence of him beguiling the kingdoms of man. What we also see is the kingdoms of man and this government in particular beginning to use political interests as a reason for violence and oppression. We see that here on the first page. I ask you to open your Bible to Exodus chapter 1. Let's take a lengthy read beginning in verse 8. Exodus 1 and verse 8. Now there arose a, a, a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel." So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. And in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So what was once this wonderful symbiotic re relationship where Egypt didn't want to be shepherds and the Jews didn't hardly know anything else except being shepherds, now Satan comes in and deceives Egypt into thinking that Israel is going to be their enemy. And they use this national motive. We have to protect ourselves from the evil people to start oppressing another group of people. And it doesn't stop simply at slavery. If you know the story of Exodus, and I'm sure at 8 o'clock on a Wednesday morning, you people know the story of Exodus. But it devolves. It devolves into we have to cull their growth. Now, what we see happening in Exodus is what God promised Abraham. Like the stars in the heaven, like the sands by the sea, so your descendants will be. They are multiplying. And even in the oppression, this blessing, in blessing I will bless you, it continues. And Egypt it, it is in a sense kicking against the goats because the more they oppress, it's almost as if the more they expand. And their fear gets the best of them to the point that Pharaoh comes up with the idea of killing the male children. The injustice and the misuse of power by the kingdom of man stands against the backdrop of creation that was just read in the Genesis. If, if you were reading through the Hebrew Bible, you see creation, and all of it is good. And now in Exodus, what you see is injustice and misuse of power. And what God said in creation, that humanity is good. Now in Exodus, we see the kingdoms of men saying, only our people are good. Other people are bad. And we need to do whatever we can do to protect ourselves from all the bad people. Beware, brothers and sisters, of falling into the mindset of the kingdoms of man. Like the course of sin in the early chapters of Genesis, Pharaoh's plan devolves into worse and worse indignities and abominations, and there is no, it is no coincidence that in killing the male children, you can't help but see the demise of Egypt foreshadowed in the plagues. And while this is abhorrent to us in our 21st century idea of what humanity ought to be like, in the ancient Near East, c considering the conquest, the subjugation, and domination of others is justifiable. In fact, you're acting like the pantheon of gods that you serve when you do those sorts of things. And we see Egypt, like all the kingdoms of men in the Hebrew Bible, end up willing to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to move their national interests forward, including killing what used to be their friends. Many years before this particular conflict, God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. In blessing, I will bless you, and if somebody dishonors you, I will dishonor them. And what we have is, again, a foreshadowing a foreshadowing that we're going to see come to play out here. Even as the slavery and the oppression continue, God is faithful. Go back and listen 
to Monday night's lecture. God is faithful. Now, what God is faithful doesn't mean is he makes everything good and right, right in the present. You take a Polaroid at Exodus, Israel's not in a good spot right now. But God is faithful and expects his people to walk by faith not by sight. Taking Polaroids in our life, brothers and sisters, is walking by sight. Seeing the larger conflict is walking by faith. Now, from one perspective, the early part of this story could be seen as a run of bad time and chance. You know, some folks like to quote the preacher, oh, it's time and chance. Oh, it just happens. But on a spiritual level, we see that the adversary is behind what Pharaoh is doing. Pharaoh and Egypt's use of violence and oppression this political ploy, well, it's just politics. Well, it was only politics to the Egyptians. It's life and death to the Israelites. We need to see and open our eyes. Political power in the kingdoms of man is part of the playbook of Satan. And when violence and oppression are used, God is not pleased. As God's people, we need to be propagating his wisdom and love and finding men and women to carry out his plan is what we see in the Bible narrative. Now, we turn to Moses very early on. Could there have been a un more unlikely leader for the people of Israel? Now, in the first 40 years, it looked pretty good, except in the first 40 years, you have the unlikeliest of salvation stories because you have a kid born during the fiat of kill all the male children. Well, he's not killed. Well, how is this going to work out? Well, uh, an unlikely story is that his mom and dad could hatch up this plan to put him in the river. And just so happens that they put him in the river where Pharaoh's family attempts to bathe. And guess who finds Moses? Well, if that's not unlikely enough, Guess who ends up nursing and raising Moses? This doesn't make any sense. Nobody would write this story. But we're not even through writing the story yet because it gets to a point that Moses, nearing the end of his first 40 years, and for reasons we are not fully told, decides to become a liberator of his people. And he goes off and he kills somebody and becomes a fugitive and then runs away from Egypt. How's that supposed to work? As Moses kills the Egyptian and leaves as a fugitive in his crime and rebellion, we're taken 40 years into the desert, which is not where you're expecting deliverance to come from. Not running away from the problem. The narrative follows Moses into the desert and the land of Midian into a well, and you know what happens if you are by a well in the Bible, you're going to find a wife. <laughs> and so he finds his wife, and he's just living his best life, shepherding out in the desert, you know, because that's where everybody wants to go. And he's run away from all of his problems until God has another plan for him. God's plan for, free, for freeing Israel from slavery and settling in Canaan takes many twists and turns. And who would have thought that God would use as unlikely a character as a fugitive from the king of Egypt to go to that king of Egypt and to tell him about the Lord? Now, what we see through the rest of of the conquest. We see the plagues and the Red Sea and God's use of them in delivering his people. The larger view of the, con con of the conflict is that we have the one true God versus the false gods of Egypt. Now, there are many studies, and you can look at the manuscript, and not only my manuscript, but go and search this study. I'm not going to attempt that. That's not the scope of this, of this study this morning. But the, the conflict between God and the false gods of Egypt is apparent in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12. And the battle, as Moses comes back, begins. And it begins with Moses appearing before Pharaoh. Now, in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2, it's, it's interesting in English because Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? Now, that's not some kind of coy ploy. He doesn't, why would the king of Egypt know about a God of a bunch of his servants and people that he hates and who he's trying to kill? 
Who is the Lord that I should believe in him? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I'm not going to let you go just because you show up and say, let my people go. He had no reason to know about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, he didn't even know Joseph. How was he going to know about this? But what we see with the plagues and what we see with the Red Sea crossing is an interesting turn of events. Have you ever watched the History Channel and have them explain the plagues to you? And you just go away, really? If you, you watch movies and you see all of this, it, it, it's a maddening assortment of people who want to take faith out of this and take God out of this situation and make it all a natural occurrence. Now, whether it's the simple natural events of the History Channel or some explanation for that it's more of a didactic and an explanation, the Exodus narrative portrays the plagues that are inflicted on Egypt as both natural devastations, but at the behest of the miraculous working of God. And as people of faith, I don't think it's incumbent upon us to have to explain all of this to people. Because when it's the working of God, it's the working of God. And you can argue against it if you want to, or you can see the truth. The plagues in Egypt have been inflicted on them, and it was a history to be written and to be understood by Israel. While some may be blinded by their own philosophy, seeing only naturalistic causes, there is no doubt what the writer of Exodus is intending for us to see. And it is God's power in his time to release his people to his glory. In Exodus chapter 7, beginning in verse 4, he says, Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. And when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out my people, the people of Israel from among them. Now, the complete devastation of Egypt is recorded plague by plague by plague as God secures the victory. Now, again, this is an unlikely way. You know what Americans would do? We send in SEAL Team 6, we take care of business, up and out, and we're done. But God, through time, used the plagues to show Egypt and Israel who he was. Because one of the things I'm convinced about, Israel didn't know the Lord either. This is a revelation for not only Egypt, but this is also a revelation for Israel. And we see this devastation of Egypt recorded plague by plague, even in Numbers chapter 33, where God says, I'm judging their false gods. Because not only did Egypt need to know that their pantheon was false, Israel needed to know that this pantheon was false. And sadly, that's not a lesson Egypt learned right off the bat. As the Lord humbles and conquers Egypt, we see, a con we see the contrast in Exodus set against the creation account. What's interesting, in Genesis chapter 13, the Genesis writer says that Egypt was like Eden. Now think about that for a minute. The paradise of God. Egypt was as good as it got in nature. And what we see in Exodus is the step-by-step -step decreation by the judgment of God. What God brought into beauty in Genesis... He then takes and decreates an exodus out of judgment. They're left devastated, and the lesson is left. In Exodus chapter 13, beginning in verse 3, remember this day. He tells, he tells Israel, remember what I'm doing. It's imperative that you remember what I'm doing, because I'm bringing you out of the house of slavery by my strong hand. I am bringing you out of slavery. I am taking care of you. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt, verse 10, and you shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time year after year. And sadly, one of the things that we learned yesterday in the lectures, they didn't keep on remembering. Of all the July 4th celebrations that we have in this country, shouldn't Israel have kept their July 4th? Their day of freedom that they had been granted by God, and they failed to remember. God's plan was to show Israel and Egypt 
that the, this pantheon of Egyptian gods is false. The conquest ends so lopsided that in, in Exodus 11, verses 7 and 8 and 12, 33, Egypt ends up begging them to leave. That's, <laughs> please leave. Please, can we pay you to leave? Here, take our money, what we have left. Take our clothes. Take, please. And then, if that's not enough, we get the stragglers to go along with them. It was so profound that some of the Egyptians were like, look, I'm changing sides here. This, may, this God is the boss, and I'm following them. And we have this mixed multitude that follows. God's victory over Egypt is completed. No king, no army, no chariots. Now, bear with me for a minute. Chariots are cutting-edge technology at this time. God uses none of this to conquer. And more specifically... And remember this, no help from Israel at all. Because what do they know? It is by his awesome power. In Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power and the Lord, that the Lord had used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. It is patently clear that God intended both Egypt and Israel to know what was going on. So what started off with Pharaoh wondering, who is the Lord, ends with full knowledge. What starts off with Moses casting a staff down and becoming a serpent ends with their chariots, their cutting-edge technology, completely useless against the power of God. Now, you can't read through the book of Exodus and this conflict here in the early chapters without some questions. There are challenging aspects of this conflict, and the first one I'd like to talk with you about this morning is Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh is a representative of the evil forces in the rebellion. He, but in, in all of this, He's not just taken out with a smart bomb. He's confronted with the truth. And isn't this a frustrating thing for Bible students? You, I mean, you look at him and like, how could somebody be so, so deaf to the truth? He starts off with who is the Lord. And step by step, God tells him who he is. Now, what's interesting is half the time the writer of Exodus says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then the other half of the time, the writer says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I'm probably not going to try to leave enough time to ask questions because I've got none. <laughs> I've got none about this except God used his power and might. But I also know sometimes in my own life, I am my own worst enemy. Because sometimes when the truth hits me right square in the head, you know what I like to do? And I, and I know a lot of people like to do this now. Oh, that's not the way it is. And here we have a man who is wrapped up in the kingdom of men. He is self-deceived and deceived by evil spiritual forces. But we shouldn't miss his humanity. Because God gives him time after time after time. God does what God does. He chooses whom he chooses. But unlike Nebuchadnezzar later, Pharaoh sets aside any humility. To Nebuchadnezzar's credit, Nebuchadnezzar, in the face of the workings of God, humbled himself. Pharaoh never did. We shouldn't wonder why the first statement in the kingdom's constitution says, poor in spirit. Because if we're not poor in spirit, ours is not the kingdom of heaven. And Pharaoh not being poor in spirit ends up on the trash heap of humanity because he was kicking against the goads of God's blessings. We shouldn't miss his humanity nor the part he played. He's neither innocent nor blameless in this. He's not just some puppet that God uses. He is fully accountable for his rejection of the God of Israel, a God who showed up to him and spoke to him. And then we also have the Egyptian magi magicians. An example, again, of evil forces afoot. 
when the powers of the priest as representatives of Egypt's gods duplicate the same things, y'all, I got questions. I got questions here. How are they able to reproduce the same signs as Moses? Admittedly to a lesser and weaker scale, but the account says they, he, they did the same things that Moses and Aaron did. And they don't explain it. I got questions. How are they able to do this? How were they able to change their staff into snakes in 711? How were they able to change the water to blood in 722? How were they able to produce frogs in 87? The writer says they did this. And I'm like, hey, hey, time out here. How is this possible? Because you see, I have lived in the 20th and the 21st century, and I've never seen anything like this. So this is obviously sleight of hand. The writer doesn't say that. He doesn't say that at all. But what, we, what he does say is, after the plague of gnats, the magicians weren't able to produce it, and they go to Pharaoh and says, God, got me, boss. I don't, pff, we can't do this. We can't do this. And see, even again, Pharaoh's own paid people look at him and say, you're in over your head here, boss. And Pharaoh refuses. But these Egyptians, these Egyptian magicians, try to say that in front of spotlights. That's just... <laughs> these magicians are a quandary. They offer us unanswerable questions, and the fact that they had this power cannot be denied and should not be dismissed. And this type of, this type of power is not only in evidence in the book of Exodus. There are other examples as well. In the manuscript, I talk about how my, my favorite, my, one of my favorite passages is 2 Kings 6. Elisha's servant comes running back in. Ah! And Elisha says, what are you worried about? And Elisha prayed, open his eyes that he may see. And what I'm hoping, brothers and sisters, friends, is that we open our eyes, but that we don't have to open our eyes and see visible forces at work for us, but that we know that God is faithful. He was faithful in Exodus. He's faithful in 2 Kings. And there's another passage of Daniel chapter 10 where the messenger shows up and Michael has been fighting against the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. I got questions, y'all. I got questions that I can't answer except to know what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 is true. Evil spiritual forces align themselves against the kingdom of God and God's ways. Paul again offers more proof of this battle and this overarching conflict when he writes to the church in Thessalonica talking about false signs and wonders. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. But I would encourage you to go back in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, Moses, on the plains of Moab, before they cross over into the Jordan, warns the people of Israel and says, There are going to be false guys who are going to come in and they're going to tell you things. And they're, and, but, but the fascinating part in those first four verses is it says, Even if they're able to do signs and wonders and they come true, but they tell you to go see other gods, don't follow them. He didn't say, oh, it's all sleight of hand. You're going to be able to explain it away. No, he didn't say you're going to be able to explain it away. He says, if they say follow other gods, don't follow them, regardless of what they're able to do, even if they say something that happens, even if they're able to do something that you can't explain away. If they say go after other gods, don't go with them. There's a temptation for modern readers, steeped in science and technology, to dismiss the existence of evil spiritual forces working on the earth. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if we are quick to dismiss the Exodus examples of evil spiritual forces, we do that to our own detriment. Because the writer doesn't say it was sleight of hand. It, he doesn't say he was like David Copperfield. It says they were able to produce and do the same things that Moses did. We should show humility and, dis and not to dismiss the reality of evil power at work, particularly in Bible times. I mean, what, what, a, what more cunning way could he convince people in our day and time? Oh, it really didn't happen that way. Oh, there was really no evil power. What more brilliant lie than... I don't exist. I'm not powerful. 
And how many people today believe that very thing about our adversary? Don't fall for his lies. We should accept that our enemy is real and remember, however, that the overarching lesson and truth from all of this, including the gospel, is that God wins every spiritual battle. He always has, and he always will. As we stated earlier, we need to talk about this broader conflict because I'm running out of time. As a disciple with our eyes open, we can see this conflict, of course, beginning in the garden and progressing through the Genesis narrative and coming into the Exodus. Exodus continues and highlights this fight, the forces of evil and rebellion against the kingdom of God. And seeing this struggle, we hear in the sermon or on the mount, God said, you shall have no other gods before me. God is drawing a line for his people. He declares war on any potential people or gods who would stand up against him. And after winning their freedom, providing for them for a generation in the, in the wilderness, and granting them a magnificent law, and setting them up in the land, Israel doesn't remain loyal. It is one of the saddest truths in all of the Bible. Through their ingratitude, sadly, Israel devolves into becoming more like the kingdom of men rather than the kingdom of God. They become enamored with the lies of polytheism and the fleshly lusts that it gives over to. God sends them prophet after prophet, pleading, wooing, warning, yelling. As much as Hosea woos his adulterous wife back, God is wooing his adulterous people back. With our eyes open, we can see his infinite love in the fight he is having with evil forces throughout all of the Hebrew Bible. But his love for them does not keep God from justice and judgment. When they behave and continue in the rebellion of the kingdoms of men time and again, God will use even evil nations as the rod of his anger as he does with Assyria, as warned about in Isaiah chapter 10, and Babylon, when he told his prophet Habakkuk that that was going to happen. And as we move forward with this conflict, the conflict continues in the Gospels. Not only do you see the conflict with Athaliah, not only do you see the conflict in in Babylon and Persia, the conflict continues in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 2, when our Lord is a child, There is a conflict because the evil forces are after him. They want him dead. And then in the face-to-face battle, after 40 years of fasting in Matthew chapter 4, here is this battle, this battle that Jesus is bringing to the kingdoms of men. In Isaiah chapter 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound or blind in the Septuagint, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Jesus enters the battlefield as the power of God. And when he enters it, it's interesting in Mark chapter 3, and Mark has a lot to say about this battle and the spiritual conflict that goes on. And as he is casting out demons and doing miracles, some of the Jews look at him and say, you're doing this by the power of Satan. Now listen to what the Lord said. No one can enter a strong man's house. No one can go onto the battlefield with the reigning victor, with the belt-wearing champ. Nobody can go in into his house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. And what we see is the conflict is proclaimed to be over through the gospel. What Jesus wins for us, he is, he's won. Praise be to God. What we see in the apocalypse is the power of the kingdoms of men, the power of the adversary rendered virtually, spiritually incompetent. But there's an unlikeliness here in Revelation chapter 12. Because how you fight and how you win is not by technology, it's not by politics, it's not by sliding into the kingdoms of men and their politics. Listen to how he says the victory comes. The victory comes, and preaching boys, this will preach, by the blood of the Lamb 
by the word of the testimony and by not loving their earthly lives too much. That's the win. As much as this is unlikely and an unlikely conqueror, Jesus, like Moses, is an unlikely leader. And we see this portrayed all through the Gospels. His disciples look at him and like, this, 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 this. none of this makes sense. This is not how we're going to win. This is not how we're going to beat Rome. And we see this not only as Jesus is tempted. He doesn't just quash Satan. He doesn't destroy Satan right there. And like Exodus, Jesus uses his personal ministry to outline unlikely ways. Whether it begins with the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus teaches time after time, one of, this, it, one of the fascinating things to me are his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus takes, or Peter takes Jesus aside and says, this isn't going to happen this way. Then in Matthew chapter 20, as the disciples are arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom, Jesus sets them down and says, this debating and arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom, you've got it completely wrong. And how they struggled with that idea. It's clear that no one understood the upside-down kingdom of Jesus. No one understood it while Jesus was on the earth. No one understood that it would be a different sort of kingdom. Brothers and sisters, do we understand that today? It is not by fashioning ourselves like the kingdom of men or business ethics and all those sorts of things. That's not what it means to be in the kingdom and to act as in the kingdom of God. Jesus and his followers after him proclaim that the power of the kingdom of God is shown vividly, not by might, not by power, and not by acting like the kingdoms of men. It is in humility. It is mourning over sin. It is hungering and thirsting for righteousness, not power, not validation. But you see, part of that problem is that doesn't satisfy the lust of the flesh. And we have to understand that that is an unsatisfying thing. It's no wonder the Lord said in Matthew 7, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Nowhere is this unlikely method and this upside-down kingdom more apparent than when Jesus confronted Pilate as the kingdom of man. When our Lord said, my kingdom is not of this world, Pilate went. Nobody had ever talked to Pilate like this before. And Pilate, of course, being the kingdom of man's representatives, is confused by this. And what's interesting is Matthew, even in Matthew... I don't know how this works. His wife sends him a note and says, don't mess with this dude. And Pilate doesn't listen. And when it looked like he might relent because of the truth, the other representatives of the kingdom of men challenge him to fealty. If you really are serving Caesar, you can't, you can't let this guy go free. And Pilate shows in principle in the kingdom of men that he will show loyalty to his king and allow this innocent man to be crucified. What remains abundantly clear is the means by which God conquers stands in stark contrast to the way that the Lord wins. Our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection are nothing like the conquests that are achieved by worldly powers. In fact, it's just the opposite. The cross of shame and death that our God chose to win the victory, we must accept by faith. Exodus, like the rest of Scripture, teaches all who will see and hear that God's values and the values of His kingdom are fundamentally different from the kingdoms of man. The question remains, which kingdom will we choose? The conflict that we have continued, that we have studied today, continues even today as we live in between the beginning of Genesis and the consummation in the new Jerusalem. The die has been cast and we believe in the victory of God, don't we? Time after time and century after century, we see God's patience and compassion toward everyone who will humble themselves before him. Our God calls us to a better, albeit upside down way of living on this earth but that is the way of victory, and it's all for our benefit. Will we live by faith and trust his unlikely ways? That's a question that we can only answer. But as we look at this great conflict, there is one passage I will end with. It's in Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 33. 
Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Let all who believe say amen. Thank you. Thank you.